before you have a seat, uh, run around the room and see if there's somebody you haven't seen in a while. Uh, tell them you're glad they're here. Get you cookies, all kinds of stuff over there. Soda, cookie, anything like that. We're back with you in a second. Okay, if you'll find a way to your seat, and if the band will show back up. <laughs> Thank you again for joining us for worship today. Um, most of your announcements are in your bulletin. Uh, we have Easter stuff that's kicking in. Uh, we have an egg hunt coming up. There's information about that in the bulletin. Um, after this service, uh, the youth and the children are going to go deliver some Easter baskets to our shut-ins in the church. So if they can stay for that, um, meet outside by the van after this service. And uh, we've started... Uh, trying to do a better job in this church to reach out to our shut-ins and it's been very well received So if you can help with that uh, Please check in after the service out of the van for you for children and you can go with them um, I want to thank everybody yesterday that helped with feed the need um, We did 250 some odd plates yesterday gave them all out And I do want to commend everybody. We had the biggest crowd of volunteers we've ever had so thank you for that. And also thank you this time. We also um, asked the church to bring desserts. And we had more than enough desserts. So we had, I would say it's fair to say, for the first time across the board participation from the church as a whole. Instead of three or four people just killing ourselves trying to do it. So I want to thank the whole church uh, across the board for helping us with that. And it's really, really uh, a good thing to see and do. So uh, we'll be doing another one probably in a couple months or so. So if you can help with it in any way, uh, thank you for doing that. And please do that. We are having this morning communion um, at the appropriate time. The ushers are going to direct you. We're going to have stations up front. I do want to remind everybody in the warehouse and in the Methodist Church, we have an open communion table. Everyone is welcome to participate. You don't have to be a member here or anything. If this is your first time here, we want you to participate if that's something you want to do. You'll come up and take a wafer and dip it into the cup and uh, just follow the directions of the ushers uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, we're going to take up the offering on this next song. Uh, buckets and baskets will come around. Buckets is money for missions. We bought the Feed the Need food out of that. Uh, the other uh, for yesterday and your regular offering to the church is going to go in the baskets and you can also give on Venmo uh, our address uh, if you just do a search on Venmo for Camille United Methodist Church it'll pull up so those are going to come around for you as we do this next song
Some of you are sitting on the beach this morning, drinking your lattes, watching the sun come up and down, and waiting to put your feet in that nice warm ocean, or swim with the dolphins, or something. Um, so I wish I could be there, but you know what? Some of us actually have to work once in a while, and, and right now I'm working about 50 minutes a day, twice, and then the rest of the time I'm taking care of a wife up in Atlanta and hopefully I can convince the doctor this Tuesday that we can come home. Um, I like Atlanta but I like Camilla even more. So <laughs> pray that the doctor will say yes. So, um, she likes to tell me no. Um, I'm not, I've got too many yeses out of her. But I did bring a little jar of oil because um, that's what our Worship is on on lingering fragrances, and um, I'm a big on smelly things. I, I like things that smell good. I um, always like good perfume or uh, fragrances. Um, my kids go nuts when I when they invented this Lysol stuff. You can spray around the house, make it smell good. I go overboard, and then this this girl that you spray. You know, you spray it on the, on the carpets and the furniture. It makes it smell good. And then my kids all run outside because I have to detoxify the house because this is cloud in the house. I like things that smell good. You know, some people, you, 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 you have different um, senses that are more sensitive. Rather, my nose is pretty sensitive and I've always enjoyed walking in the country and smelling the lilacs and smelling um, the uh, licorice plant when I call in South Africa or going to the pool and smelling the jasmine and, and everything else, the lavender plants um, in South Africa. So it's, it's a big deal for me. And my go-to gift for my wife is good perfume. Now you can get perfume that is um, alcohol-based and um, that's okay, but you know when your perfume is alcohol based, it only 
lasts so long because it's based on alcohol. But a really, really good perfume is actually based on the musk uh, oil of a uh, particular animal that is pretty uh, rare or almost um, instinct because they, they use it so much and now they've learned how to keep them alive. And um, I bought my wife some white diamonds with an uh, oil base and it, back in 1980 it cost me $100 and it lasts almost a lifetime. It's a little jar like this with about three or two ounces of that kind of oil. So fellas, that's one way you could do it. If you really like your wife and you've got some serious money, you take your wife, I'm getting you into trouble later. And uh, they'll take a, 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 a sample of the skin, the oils in her skin, and then they'll match her oils and the fragrance of her skin with what would complement and make her really smell good. And I did that one time for my wife, except I got a really good deal free. And um, <coughs> my wife's <coughs> sense is connected with uh, roses and florals. Um, those are the smells that make my wife smell really good, especially to me. But that's what the experts say, and they will then match you up a one-of-a-kind perfume. Okay, so you take your notes? Okay, because she's going to take you up on that. Okay, and so those perfumes aren't cheap. I mean, we're talking $25,000 to $100,000. And if you want to know where to get it, you have to actually fly your wife to a place called Dubai. You feel us writing this down now, right? Okay. And then um, you take her out for a wonderful meal out in Dubai. He's outside. Look at that, you know. I'm trying. I'm trying, I'm trying that, okay? Ladies, I have really tried, okay? And then, um, that's one way to show your wife love. It's not the way, in our story in the Bible, Jesus has a family that he's really, really close to. It's Mary and Martha and Lazarus, you've heard about them. In Bethany, and uh, they, He's their go-to people. I think he must have eaten there quite a few times. Okay, since he's back in the building, let's tell you where you can get really, really good perfume for your wife. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, she's been working on this for almost 365 days. This is very, very expensive perfume that she's been collecting, either maybe for a funeral or for a burial, or for some special occasion, maybe a, a wedding, you know, for wedding nights, and you want to have a, a special answer. Mary or Martha has this special perfume. And um, she wants to show Jesus how much she loves him. And this is what happens in the story. If you all turn with me in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 1 through 8. And my verses are at the bottom. Well, maybe not. Let's, if you can pull it up for me. 12, verse 1 through 8. So six days before Passover, Jesus comes to Bethany where Lazarus lived. Remember Lazarus, the one that died and he rose from the dead? And Went to Jesus Christ and said, you know, why did you do that? You know, I was in heaven. Seriously, I thought you were my friend. Whom Jesus raised from the dead, okay? Now, if you think about that, just how many of you, when you get to heaven, will get where you're going? And uh, you brought back to Kabbalah, and he said, hey, you know, you're going to have to spend some more years here? You, I don't know, maybe you didn't thank Jesus. They had dinner that was given in Jesus' honor. So Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. So Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. That's an understatement if there ever was one. And she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Let's just stop there. And for those of you that aren't visual, I don't know about you, but there is 
something strange and completely very different about that. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected, saying that the perfume was sold and the money could be given to the poor. It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he really cared about poor people, but he said it because he was a thief. And as the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in to it. And that's God's word for God's people, and it's really interesting stuff. So we got this perfume that's worth almost a hundred and a couple of, I don't know what a year is worth of. It, it, every one of us is different. So it could be anywhere from more a couple of thousand to a, a million dollar perfume. It, it, it was the good stuff. And she does something. Number one, in that society, men and women didn't really talk. It was almost like from the holiness churches here, where all the girls sat on one side of the church, and all the guys sat on the other side of the church. Maybe, just maybe, married couples could sit together because you know you can't be thinking about lovey, 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 lovey stuff. Church was serious, and you can't be able to talk to Jesus, not each other. And there's not supposed to be this love between people, just <coughs> love between people and Jesus, which I think is kind of weird because if you can't love each other, how are you going to love Jesus? And if you can't love Jesus, how are you going to love each other? kind of all goes together. It's in the Bible. And so, she loved Jesus. Okay. Anybody over here love Jesus? Okay, the next question that comes up is, how much do you love Jesus? And how do you show that kind of love to Jesus? How do you measure that kind of love? I, I was making jokes about it as I prepared for this and I got my first initial bill. And on there it said, you know, my wife just had a liver transplant, Godiva liver, $95,000. And I'm thinking, no, what they should have put down there, Godiva liver, somebody's. Life. Somebody had to give a life. Somebody had to give up a father or a mother or a child or a loved one so my wife could live. And no, no, $95,000. That, that ain't been scratching this over. And so this beautiful woman wants to show Jesus how much she loves him. Do you know something about Lazarus being risen from the dead? Do you know something about the forgiveness of sins and God's grace and his acceptance? And she's learned about relationships and faith on a deep emotional feeling Way, either way. But more than that, she is realized probably for the first time that little children, big old scrawny men, <laughs> women, young girls, old babies, grannies, grandpas are all equally important to Jesus. You know, when Mary and Martha are arguing about who's supposed to do the groceries and who gets to sit and listen to Jesus, Jesus says what? You know, the groceries are great, but just why don't you come and listen to what I'm teaching? I'm not going to be here forever. And so she takes the most expensive thing she has and she anoints his feet, which is crossing over boundaries that are completely weird for them and she washes his feet with her hair. Now I'm going to tell you up front, my wife has never massaged my feet, my wife has never cut my toenails, my feet, wife has never washed my feet. I mean, that's a, well, we don't, I've done foot washing but it's always been men. And she doesn't just wash his feet, she anoints them 
and she washes with the head. Now there's another story about where a lady washes her his feet with her tears, which I think is a, another form of worship. Now I don't know about you, but I know somebody in that room was a friend, and I don't think it was just Judas. I think Papa was very, very uncomfortable. And so Judas picking up on that says, you know, if she'd given it to me, I would have sold it and would given it to the poor. But she doesn't. So the first thing I get out of this is worship of Jesus is costly. Unless it costs you something, it probably doesn't mean much. And I've learned this on the hard way. When I got out of the military, I had been making $2 a day danger pay to get shot at. $2 a day for danger pay. And I had probably about two, three hundred rand in the bank, about two, three hundred dollars. And uh, I was worshipping in Drina Methodist Church. You all probably know where that is. And um, the preacher said, you know, I, I can't do this much longer. You're going to have to get a bigger congregation and uh, just worshiping in a, a little back um, lounge and that and eating cookies and it's just not cutting it for me. I, 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 my, my time, I just, I can't do it. And I'm thinking, yeah, you could, but you just don't want to, but that's all right. So my mom says to me, well, how big a congregation do you need? So he says, well, if you can get it to about 100 to 150, then we'll have church. So we were like, well, how do we do that? And then he says, but I also need some hymnals. So I said, well, I'll cover the hymnals if we can find the people. And my mother is very, very sneaky and intuitive, so she found this nursing home, and they needed preaching. So she said to them, if we brought a preacher in, could they preach? And he, they said, yes, anytime you want. So my mom back, went back and said, we got 150 people, plus us Methodists and one of you guys swimming on Sunday morning. What are you going to be doing? And so that's when he started coming. Not Sunday mornings, but like later on in the week. I got that part wrong. And I took my whole wage, everything I had, and I bought us Methodist hymnals. Because I wanted to be like this lady that gave Jesus everything. And I was thinking, well, oh. She's all right. Um, I'm going to be okay. And my mom's saying, Peter, you need to live on a budget and take care of what you're doing. And I'm like, no, I don't. I'm good. I've got this covered. And so I bought all these new and they showed up and they worked really good. But Monday morning came around and I needed to buy me some McDonald's something to eat and I went hungry. And that month I lost a lot of weight. And I learned something about how expensive worship can be if you're not careful. So when I preach a sermon, I tell people, be generous in your worship of God. But also make sure you got groceries to eat and you can keep the lights on. You know, there, there is something to be said for that. Be wise in how you give to God. You know, if you need to buy medicine, buy medicine. If you need, be careful how you give to God. I know there are other preachers that say, you can't out give God. Well, I've got some bad news for you. You might give God lots of stuff, but you can go hungry. Okay, just because you gave it doesn't mean, so I always tell people give with wisdom. I don't know if anybody else teaches that. Now I've lost my second time. The second is worship is active. You can't just sit and say, you know, I love Jesus, and me and Jesus got to do good. You've actually got to participate. It made my heart feel good that yesterday people were worshiping God by helping um, feed especially with desserts, that must have been kind of cool. And I know this afternoon you're going to be doing Easter baskets, right? So that's a, an important part of worship. But worship is active. You know, it is singing, it is playing music. But, it, you know, some of us aren't that musical. I can't sing. 
I know that because when I start to sing the two by Michael and the nurseries, most favorite times is when everybody's singing and I'm singing and they're in the nursery and they can hear my singing for about four or three chairs of laughter. They say it's one of the worst things I've ever heard in their lives. They think it's the funniest thing ever. But I do worship in other ways. And it's active. I paint. And my favorite paintings are uh, icons and flowers and pictures of birds. And I do a pretty good job, right, Scott? It's all right. So yours might not be that. It might be cooking and giving. Everybody has a different way of worshiping and doing. It, it might be planting and doing flowers or making gardens. I've heard so many people make gardens where people can just come and pick, but it is active. And it's also highly, highly personal. You know, worshiping is personal. The more intimate you get with Jesus, the more personal it gets. I promise you, I can't think of things too much more personal than taking your hair and getting on your knees and washing your God's feet with the most expensive oil in your life. That's pretty personal. Um, but I will add to that, I'm not Jesus. So if you come and try and wash my feet with oil and hair, because you're trying to get to Jesus, we are going to have to have a discussion. Okay? Because I think it's kind of creepy, and I'm not Jesus. Okay. And I say that in, in, in all jest. But just the other night, my wife fussed me out because I kept kicking the air conditioning, the air thingy for her oxygen over, which is not a good thing. But I was praying because I'd been deeply hurt because one of my favorite preachers, I don't like the sermons, but I like him because he's so gutsy and weird, is the guy that found Hillsong Church. Hillsong Church is a major big church. And we, we actually sing some of their songs and they do some awesome stuff. But he wrote some of the ladies inappropriate letters. And it happens a lot. A, a lot of my friends that are preachers, we go through this, and it's called sexual ethics, and somebody asked me why we do it, and so I said, we don't get into compromising places, and we don't get into doing stupid things. Because it hurts the church. And because it's a big church, I know that it's going to have repercussions across the world including Australia, where my niece goes. And so, when you're worshipping Jesus, be careful that you don't get into compromising positions. The Catholic Church went through that, and we all go through that. In fact, in the Middle Ages, uh, it, it was a, such a big problem, they made everybody become a celibate, which is not really helpful. So that's why I say that, because sometimes you'll see stuff in the Bible and go, oh, okay, well, let's do that to the preacher. But no, you need to think this through. When you're celebrating and worshiping Jesus, that's God. That's not your preacher. Never, ever worship your preacher. And there are people in this world that worship people. They worship their pastor. And if you're around me long enough, my kids will explain to you why they don't worship their daddy. I'm pretty human. I'm about as useless as most people. Okay, he's not more useless. Maybe that's why they made me the preacher. I don't know. Okay, that's another sermon. But it is deeply personal. And the more personal you get with God, and the more you open your heart to Him, the more vulnerable you become. And that is when people can take advantage of you, including pastors. I'm just putting that out there. And they can take care of you financially. I mean, they can take care of you. They can, <laughs> they can take, you know, they can hurt you financially. They can hurt you emotionally. They can hurt you physically. And they can hurt you in many ways. But it is personal. And if you get it right, there is nothing more beautiful than having that deep, intimate relationship with God where you can feel like with what, however you do it, washing, his feet with your tears and your oil. I just think it's so beautiful. In fact, it often was so beautiful, I did me a dissertation on foot washing. And I've seen people use it in special ways. I've seen people, when they got ready to get married, 
the husband kneel down and wash his wife's feet and say, you know, I want to marry you and the way I'm washing your feet, I want to treat you the way Jesus treats the church and I'm willing to die for you and I'm willing to love you and I'm willing to support you. I'm willing to be the husband that God wants me to be. I've seen two men that are angry and hateful and spiteful in the church, fighting and fighting and fighting, and then having a foot washing service. And everybody pays off and those two men are left alone. And they either have to fight it out or wash each other's feet. And I want grown men burst into tears and lose the hatred for one another so that they then can have a forgiving and strong relationship in that church. And I've seen people forgiven of their sins, deep, deeply, deeply changed, and then anointing Jesus' feet, express their love for their, their grace. In closing, one of the greatest theologians I know and it has the deepest and most profound effect on my faith. My mother told me, you know, thankfulness to God. But the people that are forgiven much are deeply, deeply changed and thankful for what God has done in their lives. My question this morning is which one are you? And how is it with your worship? We are now going to participate, which I think is in an equally intimate event, which is called communion, where we come and remind each other how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And in some strange way, we participated in a meal where we take bread, we ask God to bless it, we ask God to break it, and then we ask God to be part of it as we eat, and it renews us physically and spiritually. And then we take juice, which represents God's blood, which is poured out so that we don't have to pay the same price that others have without Jesus. And so this morning I'm going to pray and then invite you to participate, to worship, if you will, God in this intimate sacrament. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless each and every one this morning. And if they have issues in their heart or their soul that prevents them from truly experiencing your love and grace, we ask that you remove them. We ask that you bless this bread. We ask that you bless this juice. Allow it to be for us the very body and blood of Christ. So that when we drink and eat, that it will be yours. And we experience your grace in a mysterious way that only you can change and make. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. On this side we'll have one station and then on the opposite side we'll have one station. And I'm going to ask, it, let me serve you and then the body and blood of Christ broken and said for you, take, eat and drink. If you're in the bank, I would invite you to come first so that you can play something appropriate and then um, we'll, we'll take it from there. Mama, no. <coughs> and then at this time, I'm going to ask that you come as the Spirit of God leads you to take 
communion. And if you feel the Spirit leading you, take some time at the altar as well. The communion table is open. Come and feast on the grace and love of God. <coughs> Thank you.
When David worshipped God, he was running around in his underwear in the temple praising God and people criticized him. And uh, all through the Bible you will find places where people just abandoned and started worshipping God. And second chapter of Acts they were speaking in tongues and they said they were all drunk. People are going to criticize you if you pour out your heart and worship God. I'm just going to warn you in advance. But, as many of these people say, I'd rather please God than man. Because in Romans 8.31, God is for us who can be against us. Go and worship this almighty God with abandonment. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.